Hi, my name is Dr. Tova Fuller. I am Vice President of San Francisco Bay PSR, that's Physicians for Social Responsibility, and I'm joined by Patrice Sutton. Hi, Patrice. Good morning, Tova. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I'm an environmental health scientist, and I am also the chair of the Environmental Health Committee of San Francisco Bay Physicians for Social Responsibility. And I have for, since the 1980s, been um, very passionate in working to help abolish nuclear weapons, among other things. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll get back to that. Um, so, do you have any favorite facts about nuclear weapons? Do you like actually know anything about them? Well, I know uh, quite a bit about nuclear weapons, just in the sense that when I was um, in graduate school in, in the in 1980s at UC Berkeley studying environmental health, perhaps the most, um, one of the most important facts, I guess, I first be appreciated the threat of nuclear weapons had to do with the horrific and very long-lived environmental health consequences of even if they're not used, the fact that the environmental devastation that has been uh, wrought by nuclear weapons from the time you take uranium out of the ground from indigenous lands all the way through the production and then you have to deal with the waste and all of these have had horrific public health consequences. And perhaps that's the fact or the part of nuclear weapons that I've been more um, engaged in above all. And you have extensive history in environmental health uh, activism as well. So I just wanna acknowledge that. Um, is there any aspect of the intersection between environmental health and nuclear weapons that has relevance to San Francisco or the Bay Area? Well, yes, very much so. Um, you probably uh, know that the Bayview Hunters Point neighborhood in um, San Francisco in the southeastern port part of the city um, is a large African American community although now it's becoming increasingly gentrified, which is also part of the story. That community, um, so in the, in the uh, 1950s, the United States tested nuclear weapons in the Pacific, causing horrific damage to the lives over, since then, of the people who lived on the islands that were in fact destroyed and decimated and left huge amounts of contamination in the Pacific where these weapons were exploded to test them. But then the ships were brought back to San Francisco and they were quote unquote decontaminated by sandblasting the ships when they arrived at the Bayview Hunters Point shipyard in San Francisco. And when you can imagine, if you have a ship that's covered with high levels of radioactive materials and you sandblast it, you then say, let's get rid of it by putting it up in tiny particles in the air that will then fall down on the community and be there pretty much long before, long after all of us are gone. And so this contamination has, um, ha has also been amplified by the fact that the neighborhood itself, because of racism in our country, has experienced huge levels of environmental injustice and environmental contamination. There's two freeways, there's lot, there was a PG&E facility. So you basically have an, an environmental, um, uh, a, a situation of a huge amount of toxic and radioactive material been imposed on this community without their will as a legacy in large part of uh, the United States nuclear weapons program. Do you think um, the majority of people that live in San Francisco know about this issue? I don't think so at all. Um, I think that there's, because as I mentioned, the community is being gentrified. To some extent, there's been development. Of course, housing is something our city badly needs. So as the city has expanded to this, um, with new housing, there's people who've now moved in and those newcomers are becoming more aware of the history of the community. For the people who've lived there, they are, this has been their lives. This is 
This is multiple generations. So no, the African-American community has been extremely aware and extremely alone most of the time in fighting this great environmental injustice right here in our own backyard. And it's become more, I mean, it's become increasingly in the news at times because in fact, in the, it, it's a super fun, the, baby, the shipyard itself is a super fun site and the cleanup of the Superfund site has been, um, has led to several people going to jail and um, because the, the data to see if the cleanup was operating uh, as it was supposed to be was basically falsified by the contractor. So you have, you have, a, you have a, like a series of lies upon lies upon lies. So the community was lied to for decades and decades over generations, the fact that there was no health harm from essentially being exposed to the toxic and radioactive contamination. And then when it started to get cleaned up, the, the contractors who were employed by the Navy to do the cleanup lied about what that the cleanup, that the, the materials were clean when they were not. And it's kind of continued to be a, um, less than true appraisal of what the situation is because there's um, a competing interest in developing the sites. And of course, I'm, so my expertise is public health and it's extremely hard to really link anybody's individual health problem to contamination. You can do that on population level. You can say this community has more exposure to air pollution and look at this, they have more cancer, they have more asthma, they have more COPD, they have heart disease, they have more problems. But it, you, there's really not the ability for most environmental health um, exposures to draw a straight line to a particular exposure. And so in fact, the polluters are generally able to say, oh no, look that way, it's not my contamination, it's not the radioactivity, it's that somebody has air pollution or that somebody smokes or somebody doesn't eat enough apples a day. And so there's no accountability for the environmental harm that has happened and been, um, that, been, that the, the people who have lived in Bayview Hunters Point um, have been uh, subject to. Yeah. Um, just to shift gears a little bit, um, do you have a project or um, event that you participated in on nuclear weapons that you are particularly proud of? Well, I can think of a lot, I guess, um, in the sense of not so much the pride part, but in the sense that, um, so as a public health scientist, I guess the fact that Probably the the main contribution that I have um, have had is just that using the science to help support communities um, who have been harmed by nuclear weapons. And so, in the 1990s, when in the early 1990s, a lot of the horrific contamination from the nuclear weapons production cycle came to light, and there there was a lot of activity federally to try to both um, catalog the harm and study it. And also in some cases for the communities that have been directly harmed, particularly the workers um, and the, the local communities at the fence line of these extremely hazardous facilities. Um, so there was like a federal advisory committee that I was a community member that supported that advisory committee. And we also did a lot of work with the communities so that their voices could be heard. And so, you know, there's public health and there's science. And then there's also, there's deep knowledge in exposed communities that's a source of, in, of knowledge that is often left out of science in general. So a lot of the effort was to bring the knowledge base of the directly exposed populations into the scientific decision-making as a legitimate source of knowledge. So that's a part of it. And then the other part of it that I would say that um, to me means a great deal is I've participated in probably a dozen or possibly more than a dozen times been arrested for nonviolent civil, in nonviolent civil disobedience um, uh, activities in order to protest nuclear weapons. 
um, both at the Nevada test site to try with, in the case of the Nevada test site, many times with large, um, large numbers of um, members of the American Public Health Association, um, that a lot of those um, activities and those demonstrations were organized by the American Peace Test and other nonprofits. But again, it was an opportunity for public health people who understand you cannot have um, peace is a prerequisite for public health. So the nuclear weapons production cycle represents a direct threat to public health because essentially it's, it's completely undermining the possibility of peace. It's saying we can't have peace. We have, to, we have to threaten people with the use of horrific weapons that threaten all of humanity. And so as a public health professional, there's really nothing to do except protest this. This is one of the largest, if not the, um, and it's not unrelated to climate, existential threats of our time, certainly my time on this earth. So um, really protesting and putting one's um, body on the line, so to speak, I think was, I guess would be a second aspect of, I think of my public health, how public health voices need to be heard related to nuclear weapons. Yep. Um, so as an expert, I believe you are an expert. What do you think, uh, and this is the second to last question, what do you think the most important thing we could do towards preventing nuclear war? Probably, well, I guess on some level, I don't think ever about anything, there's one thing. I think everybody, so I ended up in public health so for a variety of reasons, I was exposed to toxic chemicals in my workplace and it kind of led me into a field of public health and environmental health. But everybody's path is different and life kind of shows itself to what your contribution would be. You're a physician, so you have a medical voice to speak with. So I don't know that there's one thing. I think what there is the commonality is to recognize that nuclear weapons represent the domination of one group of people over another. And so I see it that when you're fighting for um, reducing the police violence, when you're, you know, you're fighting for justice um, in, in other avenues, they're not unrelated because nuclear weapons are really, to me, the ultimate in using power to dominate other people. So where one's life, where in one's life it shows itself that you disagree with that as a way to run a world. Um, it might not be, you know, lending your voice directly around nuclear weapons. It may be lending your voice about racism in your community. Um, all of these systems of domination where one group is gonna, so because nuclear weapons is just the force that's used to say we're gonna dominate you. It's a force that the US has used around the world to exert power, even if the weapons haven't been used. Daniel Ellsberg has made that point that the US has used nuclear weapons, even though they haven't been exploded since Japan, to exert its power. And of course, it's why other countries desire these weapons. It's why North Korea wants a weapon, because look, it seems to work. The US has got a lot of power. Let's get some nuclear weapons. So. I think that all work that um, ties to essentially creating a world where the value of all humans is understood to be equal is in a way working against nuclear weapons. Because once you have that perspective, then the idea of nuclear weapons becomes so insane, which it is. So I guess fighting against systems of domination of one group over another on some level is the ultimate in anti-nuclear work. And, and you know that might be because you're fighting for budgets and saying, let's take the money from nuclear weapons and other systems of mass destruction and put it into public health, which of course would be where I think in education, I mean, public health in the broadest sense. Um, I don't, I think we need to fight for the things that everybody wants, health, medical insurance, healthcare, 
good food, that you can make good choices about what you eat. It's a good job, uh, housing. And in our country, we have favored building weapons over providing and ensuring a system where everybody essentially has the human rights to basic survival, um, things that everybody needs to survive. So it's not one thing, um, but it's, it's where, where life shows you your place to, to raise your voices. That's the thing you can't step back from. I think my favorite piece of that was um, as a psychiatrist, just hearing you talk about like how we need to think about this issue differently. If you thought about it this way, oh my God, that sounds like an abomination. So I think we need more psychiatrists to do cognitive restructuring on a large scale. Well, you know, that's interesting because in a way, you know, I say to my grandchildren, and there are people who have written enormous amounts of wonderful books that say this in such an eloquent way. So I'm not going to say it eloquently, but you know, everything's wrong, really. So because we live, I have grown up in a system, but there's other, th other sy similar systems where where the, the starting premise has to do with the supremacy of some groups over another. And so then wherever you kind of are born into, you end up, you know, so I was born in Queens and I'm a white woman who was not a rich person and, and have moved up somewhat in my class, but you know, um, because I got an education and I got an education because public schools were available to me. And so there's just a way that um, people, you know, you try to fit into a system, but I think that any system that's based on domination, like by nuclear weapons, is broken. It's wrong, and it filters down into everything we do that's unjust. So I think that in terms of your point about the mindset, whether it's a psychiatric intervention or just sort of a starting point of not trying to normalize something because it is crazy. We have normalized the idea that nuclear weapons are somehow sensible or have kept the peace. And they are systems to kill massive amounts of people so that what? So that we can then help them clean up the mess? I mean, exactly what does that look like when you stop and think about it? So now we are modernizing our nuclear weapons at a, a horrendous cost and which are tremendous opportunity costs that we're not spending on climate, for example, and huge threats to humanity. So we're, we're doing this to make nuclear weapons more efficient and safe. So just stop and think about that and then think about that that's normalized, that people get up and say that, that I want a safe nuclear weapon that will efficiently kill people. And that's a normal conversation. So I think maybe you're right in terms of psychiatrists, the importance of psychiatry. But I think it's not like, I don't think that those of us who think that that's crazy need a psychiatrist. We just need, we need to vote. I was <laughs> sure. Words, yes. <laughs> yes. And we're just, you were, but I'm just saying it is, it's like this craziness. It's, it's mass psychogenic illness to think that that a nuclear weapon should be efficient. I mean, they need to be stored safely until they can be dismantled. I'm not saying, and we've created the waste. So we have now a mountain of bad choices that we have to choose among because this waste will be with us even if we stop today in time frames that are truly unimaginable for any of us. And that's been stated by the National Academy of Sciences. We're talking about the, the National Academy of Sciences talks about it like in perpetuity. What does that mean? So it's not, um, it, the important thing is to never allow this to be normalized. And of course it is now. People, people talk about it like that's normal. It's not. Yeah. Um, truly appreciate your passion, your expertise. Um, for me, this is the most important question. Um, what can we do to 
heightened awareness in like younger generations, specifically millennials, of the threat of nuclear weapons and war? Well, I found my uh, path because um, I really was not, I mean, I just was like kind of a, a boring younger person. I mean, in the sense, like, I didn't grow up knowing. Well, I, I mean, I grew up knowing about nuclear weapons because it was normalized to me in my era that you had to duck and cover and practice getting under your school desk and crazy, crazy things that it was like, okay. So I'm like, so what, what woke me up when I was younger was truly hearing people talk about nuclear weapons who knew more about it than me. In the case of me, I heard Helen Calicut Caldecott speak in the early 1980s and it and then when I was at the same time literally going to public health school shortly thereafter actually hearing her um, I was extremely fortunate to have had um, uh, people who were um, in Physicians for Social Responsibility as it turns out some of the founders of Physicians for Social Responsibility like Victor W. Seidel and Jack Geiger um, and others who literally, um, and other members of actually the local chapter who were in Berkeley School of Public Health, and I, I took a course. And I guess what I'm saying is, that's how when I was young, I found out about things. I'm not quite sure I know about how people, like I didn't know, my point is I didn't grow up as a political person, even though I, I should from a demographic standpoint have been, but I, I kind of miss the 60s for other reasons where we get into that. So, so my point is, is that um, I think I was educated. Mm -hmm. That's how I was, I, I was educated. And so I think that whatever the, um, the ways that younger people are educated now and learn, um, we need to make sure nuclear weapons is part of those systems. So I guess people are educated obviously through schools and, um, and curriculum and also through lots of other mediums now. Um, so that's the only way, I, that's how I learned somebody taught me. So we need to teach people in wherever they are now. So they, teachers came to me. So we need to go to where people learn about things now in all those venues. So. Patrice, maybe someone will watch your video. <laughs> they, oh, well, I, I want to comment. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Tova, for what you're doing. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.